When you think about businesses that are selling through the roof, like Skims or Allbirds, sure, you think about a great product, a cool brand, and great marketing. But an often overlooked secret is actually the businesses behind the business, making selling and for shoppers buying simple. For millions of businesses, that business is Shopify. It's home of ShopPay, the number one checkout in the world. You can use it to boost conversions up to 50%, meaning way less carts going abandoned and way more sales going through to checkout. Upgrade your business and get the same checkout all birds uses. Sign up for your $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash income, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash income to upgrade your selling today. Shopify.com slash income. This is Cindy Burnett. Welcome to my award-winning podcast, Thoughts from a Page, a member of the Evergreen Podcasts Network. On this show, I chat with authors whose books I have enjoyed about their new releases and others in the book world about the books they have loved. With so many books coming out weekly, it can be hard to decide what to read, so I find the best ones and share them with you. After taking the month of September off, I am really happy to be back. It was a much-needed break, and I'm excited to be chatting about books again. Today, I'm chatting with Kimberly Brock about The Fabled Earth. The cover for this one is just gorgeous. And as soon as I started reading, I went down so many rabbit holes learning all about Cumberland Island and everything the Carnegies did while they lived there. I loved it so much that I made it a Buzz Reads pick for October. Kimberly is the award-winning author of The Lost Book of Eleanor Dare and The River Witch. She is the founder of Tinderbox Writers Workshop and has served as a guest lecturer for many regional and national writing workshops. She lives near Atlanta with her husband and three children. I hope you enjoy our conversation. ABC Thursdays. Welcome back. Grey's Anatomy is all new. Why didn't you tell me you were pregnant? The drama going down. Bungee jumper from the bridge is cord snapped. We need all hands on deck. Is unbelievable. You think you're God's gift to this hospital? You're just another doctor. My relationship with Catherine is complicated. I'm gonna sue you. Your lawyers know where to find me. You're unbelievable. Grey's Anatomy. All new Thursdays, 10, 9 central on ABC and stream on Hulu. Welcome, Kimberly. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you, Cindy? I'm great, and I'm so glad you're back, and I loved The Fabled Earth, so I can't wait to talk about it. Oh, I'm so glad you'd like it. I was excited to send it to you. Yes, it was such a fun read, and what a stunning cover. We'll talk about that later, but I'm telling you, it is the perfect cover for the book, and it is just beautiful. I love it. I love all those vines. I agree, and the house, and the water, all of it. It was such pretty colors, too. They did such a good job with that. I like that it's beachy, but not a beach. (laughs) I agree. It really does evoke the area that you wrote about, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. So before I dive into my other questions, would you give me a quick synopsis of The Fabled Earth? Oh, quick. You're asking a writer of literary fiction to be quick with a synopsis. That's funny. The Fabled Earth is about Three women whose lives intertwine in 1959 when questions about a really tragic event from 1932 bring them all together. On this little stretch of land on the coast of Georgia, a fictional town of Reverie, and right across the river is Cumberland Island, which is our southernmost island. And It's set against the backdrop of all of the crumbling summer mansions that the Carnegie family built there back in the Gilded Age. So it's a little bit of a mystery. It's a little bit of a ghost story. I have to say that I love that you said Carnegie because that was going to be one of my questions for you. For years, I said Carnegie. And then I was at one of the Carnegie libraries and they said, oh, it's Carnegie. And I was like, it is? So I was like, I've been saying it wrong all this time. So before you and I talked, I got on the internet and Googled how do you pronounce Carnegie? And the Carnegie Society had it showing that people pronounce it both ways. In America, it's often Carnegie, but that in Scotland, where he came from, it's Carnegie, and that that's what a lot of people prefer saying. Yes, and I I learned it sort of the same way you did through research and listening to interviews. And I I was kind of tickled because I, I like finding little things like that. And 
I often find that, you know, as a reader, and, and I've seen a lot of people talk about this lately, especially as a young reader, you'll pronounce things incorrectly because you you know the word from reading, but you don't know the word by ear. So I like that. I like that it's almost like a little secret. I agree. I love it too. And so I was going to ask you your preferred pronunciation, but you beat me to it. There you go. So Cumberland Island is a focal point of your story, and it is just a fascinating place. How did you decide to write about it? A couple of reasons. So I grew up in North Georgia, but my first trip to the beach was when I was about three years old, and my dad's best friend had a house on St. Simons Island off the Georgia coast. So I grew up loving the Georgia coast and, and the beach there, but I had never been to Cumberland before, even as an adult. So we went and stayed at the Grayfield Inn on Cumberland for our 25th wedding anniversary a few years ago, and I was so excited to go. I had another reason that I wanted to see Cumberland. We got married in 1996, and I remember very well that a few months after we were married, it hit the news that JFK Jr. and Carolyn Bissett had been married in a secret wedding on Cumberland Island. And I was so into that. I was very excited about it. And it was just because it was on Cumberland and it was this small little secret wedding. And our wedding had been this small little wedding in our backyard. And so I, it was a romantic idea. So then I remember a few years after that, when that tragic plane crash happened, and I was sort of obsessed with that too, because I felt sort of, I don't know, a personal connection to that story because of our weddings, which is silly, but something about the fact that they had done it in Georgia made it personal to me. So we're pulling up alongside Cumberland Island because you get there by ferry. And it's spooky and beautiful, and there's all of the twisty live oaks and all of the moss swaying in the breeze. And my husband and I, besides the guy that was captaining the ferry, who also runs the inn, were the only people on the boat, so it was very quiet. And we pulled up alongside that island, and it occurred to me in that moment that it would have also been their 25th wedding anniversary. And I thought all the hair on my head and back of my neck stood up, and I thought, wow, if there was ever a place to write a ghost story. And so that's where it started for me. I wanted to write a ghost story. I wanted a place that I could set this story about history and change and all of the things that we don't like to talk about in our history here in this region and all of the beauty of it too and how those two things can exist at the same time. And Cumberland felt like all of that to me. And this strange history of the Carnegie family. It, it, you know, Cumberland has all of this long history and everything you would expect for a southern coastal island, except here are these beautiful Gilded Age mansions that just don't belong there at all. That was just very compelling to me. I, I wanted to think about that and see what, what would happen if I set a southern story there. And it felt very Southern Gothic to me. So that's where it comes from. Well, I was very unfamiliar with Cumberland Island and was so intrigued once I started reading about it. I mean, I went down so many rabbit holes on Google, yeah. learning all about all of this. Like I didn't know the Carnegie's had built houses there. I was fascinated with what had happened to the houses. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I've spent a while researching it, but I still feel like you have a much better sense, especially because you've been there, of what the different houses were and what the status is now? Well, now, today, Cumberland Island is a national park, but it is still predominantly wild. It's still undeveloped in many ways. Over the years, it's changed. It, you know, it's as, it is as old as our American history and older. And the people that have come and gone and come and gone and come and gone, that really resonated with me. And it wasn't until the 19, I guess, 1880s that the Carnegies came. So there's Andrew Carnegie that everybody's familiar with, great philanthropist, built all his libraries, gave all his wealth away. And since, of course, this is a Southern story, I'm writing about his brother, Tommy. <laughs> so Tommy and his wife came and bought property 
on Cumberland for for summer homes. His wife really liked it, and and there was a, a house, uh, the original Dungeness Mansion, that was a revolution, Revolutionary War time house standing at that time in the 1880s. It had been burned, but it was still there, and she wanted that property to build their summer home. So after after a little drama there, they finally acquired that property. They raised that house and they built a new one. So within just a few months, years, I think, actually, Thomas dies and Lucy's alone with their nine children. And she continued to build that house, then built houses for her children on the island. And they would summer there. I think by the 1920s, and I believe it was 1925, they had had to abandon Dungeness Mansion. And they were living in the other homes, but they couldn't afford to keep it up. It was so sprawling. Everything had to be brought onto the island by boat. So it was very expensive to to keep this house and, and make it habitable. They took all the furniture and different things out of it. And they were still living some months on the island. Some months the homes were closed. Some of them burned over the years. There are still some of them standing. Plum Orchard is one of them. It's huge and still there. Nobody lives in it. Dungeness burned in 1959. And that's part of my story. That They know it was an arson, but no one's ever been convicted of that. They think it had to do with a lot of trespassing that was going on on the island and some bad blood between the Carnegie family and folks who were coming in and poaching on the islands. So I think of Cumberland still as this wild, it still to me belongs to itself. And a lot of people have tried to call it home over the years, including the Carnegies. And then you mentioned a third building, the hotel that you stayed at, that is run by descendants of one of the Carnegie families, right? And so it's also still standing. Yep. I didn't mention Grayfield. So Grayfield is now an inn. And it it became an inn in the 1960s when the original Lucy, her granddaughter Lucy, turned it into an inn. And now that Lucy, Lucy Ferguson, her grandchildren now run it, Mitty Ferguson. And then Gogo Ferguson is a, an artist and she makes beautiful jewelry and she lives part time there on the island, too. And the house that you can tour that the National Park operates is Plum Orchard. And then Dungeness is kind of has ruins that you can walk around, correct? Yes, and it's so spooky and wonderful. And it was funny, you know, we went and spent that that long weekend there and I wrote this book. And then no sooner had I finished writing it than I, I really wanted to take it all back because I know people are going to want to go and see it because it is amazing. And part of me really wants to protect it. And just say, no, don't go, don't go, (laughs) because it's wonderful, just like it is. Absolutely. And that is always the danger, I guess, of highlighting a place that not as many people are familiar with, or maybe tons of people are familiar with it, and I just wasn't. But it was someplace that I was totally intrigued by, and I would love to go visit for the day, but you make a valid point, too. Yeah. Well, they they fight for the conservation of that place. It, It is their home, you know, and... I I can't imagine what that what that must entail, that sense of responsibility for a place like that. Well, and there was a lot of chatter online about Plum Orchard and how it's not kept up very well by the Park Service and that it shouldn't be a Park Service property. So it's really interesting. And I'm not weighing into any of that because I haven't been there. But it was interesting to read about it, that it, it does seem like a different type of Park Service property than you often see. You're correct. Yeah, it was just kind of curious. And that was another reason, because we're huge National Park people that I wanted to go because I was like, hmm, I'm kind of curious to see how all this is. You feel um, obligated to to that responsibility when you're there to just take care and to pay attention to to the footprint you're leaving. And I think there's a lot of value in that. There's there aren't many places left like that. I agree. And the other part of it is that in the Gilded Age era, people built these massive homes and Very few people could afford to do that. The people that did could afford it then, but due to changes in the country and the way things unfolded, they couldn't really use them for very long, as you mentioned. So it's almost like 
a reflection on the waste that happened with some of these places. I mean, they're wonderful to see. I love to go to Newport and visit all these places, but it's also kind of mind boggling that this money could have been used. Yeah. Could have been used for all these other things like Andrew Carnegie did. So it's just kind of one of those you're like, huh, you know, it's difficult to think about building a home that maybe was used for 40 years as a summer home. It is. (laughs) You know. (laughs) And I I wanted there to be for for the fictional characters, you know, I wanted this setting to feel very mythical. And I I felt like I was looking for something to represent sort of a set of old gods and the Carnegie family sitting out on this Southern Island where you least expect them to be and sort of, you know, distant and strange. It seemed to work very well for the metaphor I was looking for. Absolutely. And out of touch with the locals and there's this friction. No, I I agree with that completely. Well, tell me a little bit more about your fictional characters, how you came up with them, all of that. Clea Woodbine was easy because her grandfather, uh, she's the main character of the three female protagonists in this novel. And they all have their their chapters with their points of view about the story. Because Cleo is this girl when she's young who sort of lives in her head. She's prone to flights of fancy. And then she she lives through a tragedy, losing her parents and has imaginary friends as a child. And I was very much in my head a lot as a little girl. And I think that was easy to identify with. So then she comes to Cumberland because she has these ideas, these misconceptions about her grandfather. She she sort of made this this larger than life hero out of him. He is a man who is from Scotland who tells all of his folk tales to her growing up and He's friends with the family that live at Plum Orchard, and they build a cottage for him to live in as artist in residence, and he is a watercolor artist, so he he makes a book, one single book, while he lives there, and it has his watercolor illustrations and his folktales in it, and she aspires to be like him. And it brings her to Cumberland because she, after her grandparents are dead, she goes after that artist in residence cottage. She wants that for herself. But her ideas about him are grandiose. Like he was really important to the to the Carnegie family. And maybe he wasn't as important as she thinks. And she shows up, this little girl who has never seen this kind of money and steps foot on this wild island that is just like nothing she's ever seen before. And I had a lot of those feelings myself when I walked onto that island. So that's part of where where Cleo comes from. Cleo makes some decisions over the summer, gets caught up in a love triangle, and makes some really terrible, youthful decisions. You know, the things that we do in our youth sometimes they just seem like they're the worst mistakes you make in your life. And they're really hard sometimes for people to come back from. They can really be life-changing. They change the course of, of your life, the directions things take. And maybe you have to be older and wiser to be able to look back at yourself and have perspective on those things. Those, those were the questions I was thinking about when I was writing about Cleo and what happens to her. She ends up as a recluse after the events in 1932 at a bonfire where a bunch of wealthy kids are telling stories and things go really wrong and two boys drown. And Cleo is in the middle of that. So in 1959, one of the girls that's in that group of wealthy kids who are there for that evening, she dies. And her daughter comes to Cleo with questions about her mother's life. So Frances Flood is the second voice. She's a folklorist and she's interested in Cleo and interested in, in unraveling what happened to her mother that summer and how it shaped her life. And then the third character is Audrey Howell. She is a young, newly widowed girl who is innkeeper in Reverie, the town that's on the other side of the river on the mainland from Cumberland. And she develops a photograph, this eerie photograph, that is an accidental double exposure. 
and some people in town believe that she has raised a ghost. It's a photograph of one of the boys from that night who hasn't been seen since 1932. So the way that they come together around what happened years ago and how it has affected them then and the changes that are happening in this little sleepy town in 1959 um, all culminates with the burning of Dungeness Mansion. And the changes that are happening in this small town in 1959 are emblematic of the change that's happening everywhere. And I thought it was really interesting to see how it was unfolding in this small town, knowing that it was also unfolding across the country in that same time period. Yeah, I wanted to, I'm a white woman living in 2024. There are a lot of things about living in the South and living through that period of American history, anywhere in America, that are hard for me to really conceive of. But I, I can remember learning about our library in the town I grew up in being segregated. I can remember learning about the historic theater in our town being segregated as a little girl. And those were the two places that I loved the most. And I... I think if there are stories that have haunted me, it would be those, those stories, hearing my grandmother talk about that, hearing my mom talk about that. So I wanted to look at these people, these women, and I wanted to see what they would do. I don't think they're courageous. I don't think they're heroic. I didn't want them to even be aware before they were standing in the middle of a situation where a choice was in front of them that they were ever going to have to make a choice. And I, I wanted them to make mistakes. I wanted them to have regrets. I did not want to create heroes. I just wanted to see what they would do. And sometimes they do the right thing for the wrong reasons. Sometimes they do the wrong thing. I wanted them to be human in that moment. And I, I hope, if nothing else, that those are the conversations that come out of this because I don't. I don't know what I would have done standing in some of the situations that they're in. I know that I could have written them to be much worse situations than than I did. I wanted to believe that just an everyday occurrence for them was something that they would look back at. You know, that they, that's those are our ghosts, I think. The things that are hard to talk about, the things that we don't know, the stories we don't know how to tell later to our kids, the stories that our kids, like me, um, are trying to unravel, that they've heard from their parents or their grandparents. And then I also was thinking a lot about, you know, where we, where we are today and what, who, who is allowed in the library and who is not, so to speak. And I think it's really difficult to reconcile a lot of our history and so it's interesting when you have a book like yours that makes you think, and I appreciated that. I hope so. I, I am very aware that I'm going to get it wrong. I'm going to get it wrong more than I get it right. I think that's why we, why we write. We, we should change with every book that we write, with every story that we read. It should make us think. It should make us talk. It should make us reassess. And I set this book in a place where the natural, you know, the natural setting for this book to me, the thing that spoke to me the most was this river and this spot on this river that, that was they call the dividings, where the tide runs both ways. And I think that theme of of ghosts and what makes us human and how a story works, what it's for, how it functions is this idea that it runs both ways, that we have the capacity as humans to reflect on history and also dream about a future and live and exist in this fixed point at, all at the same time. All of those things are happening at the same time. They overlap. And I hope when people read this book that that's what they take away from it, these cycles that just repeat, 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 and we can't be afraid of the cycle or afraid to reflect or afraid to look forward. It matters that we can do all of those things at the same time. And the other thing that it really made me think about was family stories are often myths and larger than life ancestors and the way stories make their way down through 
different families. And it's just interesting, as you talked about Cleo trying to reconcile the grandfather she thought she knew and knew about with her actual grandfather. Yeah, I mean, the people that we love, don't we romanticize who they are in the world and who they are to us? And and I don't think that's entirely a bad thing. I think that that is, that is kind of the magic of love, <laughs> that we can forgive fallible things in the people that we love and in ourselves. It, it can also be dangerous if you're not willing to see the truth about yourself or somebody else just because you want to make a hero of them. So I, I was looking at all of those things, and I love her her the charismatic quality of her grandfather and that she has that in common with him. I love that I think by the end of the novel, Cleo is able to to dream again and and to see a future for herself. And her her grandmother is this very practical woman. And Cleo really rejects that when she's younger. And then she turns into that out of necessity and realizes that that was a form of love too the way that her grandmother rejected all of the storytelling and only wanted her to to think about the practical things in life to take care of herself and be independent. And by the end, I think there's a balance in Cleo's life. That's what I'm hoping for. And I love the way the storytelling and these folklore stories and the the, the ghost stories, I think those things bring these three women together who at the beginning of the book feel very alone in the world and they find connection through those things. I love how well all of those things wove together. I liked using art in lots of ways in this book. I loved the music in this book. I loved that Audrey Howell has her photography. I loved that Frances Flood loves folklore. I loved that Cleo has her watercolor. I loved that Audrey kept the, the records from her young husband. She inherited his record collection that she keeps them playing at the inn. And so you hear all this music from the 1950s and I could imagine that place and I could feel it and taste it and hear it in my mind while I was writing the book. And I hope that's very sensory for the readers. Definitely an incredibly strong sense of place. Well, I loved your cover, as we touched on earlier. Let's talk a little bit about both the title and how it came about and the cover. So I had a friend lately who said uh, she, was, she was describing my writing, and she says, it's melancholic and earthy, and fa it's a fable. And I thought, okay, that's probably the best I've ever heard my writing described, <laughs> all, of, all of my novels. And so I was, I had kind of a word salad for this book. It was hard to find a title to land on for it, but I knew I wanted fable in the title and I wanted something to really ground it in reality. And so those were the two words that came together. And I got lucky because for uh, Lost Book of Eleanor Dare, I didn't title that book. And this one was my title. I got to title this book. The publisher liked it. So that's where that comes from. I love that. And what about the stunning cover? Again, I I got some input, but really, truthfully, this is the image that came to me almost from the very beginning from my publisher. Well, they hit it out of the ballpark. Yeah, that's amazing. Yes. the My publisher sent it to me, and the only thing we did was punch up some colors a little bit. I felt like the little house was just a little lonely. We, You know, it was too sweet at one point, and then it was too lonely. <laughs> so we worked on that just a little bit. But what I was most excited about is that it's not a beach. I love the beach. I love the ocean. But what I really love is a marsh. And when I thought of Cleo and, and her circumstances in this little house, it's called Woodbine Cottage, I didn't want it to look like she was, you know, a little old lady living on the beach because she's not. She's she's barely in her 50s. And I, I wanted her to be living in this wilderness to some extent. And so when they came back with this and you can see the water all around her, she's very reclusive. I liked that. I liked the marsh. I like the marsh, too. And it definitely seemed reminiscent of your story as well as it just seems very isolated, mm -hmm. which she was. Yep. 
Well, Kimberly, before we wrap up, what have you read recently that you really liked? How many times is it legal to read the Madeline Miller's novel, Circe? Because <laughs> I have read that book so many times in the last two years. I always end up putting it on my list. I loved Demon Copperhead. I've also read that one multiple times. I think I'm I'm very drawn to character-driven novels, and, and both of them are just masters at, at that. And I love Jess Kidd. All of Jess Kidd's novels are really just thrill me. I love to read her, her characters. I love her turn of phrase and Sarah Perry's novels as well. All sorts of good stuff. Too much good stuff. Yeah, exactly. It's a story <laughs> of my life. <laughs> the pile grows way larger than I could ever read. And I'm like so happy when I finish a book and then I look over, I'm like, I've added five books in the time that I read this one book. That is the truth. I have stacks stacked up behind me right now that I'm trying to get to. And I, I try and read for other authors. That's where a lot of my reading time goes for blurbs and just reading for pleasure. I have to sneak them in now every once in a while. Yeah, I get that. <laughs> well, I'm so glad you came back on the Thoughts from a Page podcast. Kimberly, it was delightful to chat with you. It was wonderful to chat with you. Thank you very much. Absolutely. And thank you. Coming up on 5-Minute News, I'm Anthony Davis. You might think it's partisan because maybe it's critical of one side or the other, but it's not. It's just the truth. And I think that's also something that's kind of unusual for Americans listening to the radio or to podcasts because the news landscape in the States has been so partisan for so many decades. So 5-Minute News is verified, truthful, independent, unbiased and essential world news daily. You know, a lot can happen in seven minutes, and luckily, that's how long it takes me to tell a story. My name is Aaron Califato, and I'm the creator of 7-Minute Stories. I'm proud to partner with Evergreen Podcasts, and I'd like to invite you to join me on this journey. I'm going to take you on some crazy roller coaster rides using my unique extemporaneous storytelling style, and together, we're going to try to make sense of the world, all through the art of storytelling, and all in approximately seven minutes. Thank you so much for listening to my podcast. I would love to connect with you on Instagram or Facebook, where you can find me at Thoughts From a Page. If you enjoy the show and have a moment to rate it or subscribe to it wherever you listen to your podcasts, I would really appreciate it. It makes a huge difference. And please tell all of your friends about Thoughts From a Page. Word of mouth does wonders to help the show grow. The book discussed in this episode can be purchased at my bookshop storefront, and the link is in the show notes. I hope you'll tune in next time. Welcome to Novel Conversations, a podcast about the world's greatest stories. I'm your host, Frank Lavallo, and for each episode of Novel Conversations, I talk to two readers about one book, and together, we summarize the story for you. We introduce you to the characters, we tell you what happens to them, and we read from the book along the way. So if you love hearing a good story, you're in the right place. Our ninth season is coming this fall. Tune in to hear from some of the all-time great authors, Charles Dickens, Jules Verne, F. Scott Fitzgerald, and more. Subscribe to Novel Conversations wherever you listen to podcasts. Are you tired of seeing your teen or young adult struggle on a path that clearly isn't the right fit? Is your teenager confused about which direction to take after high school? The future of work is changing rapidly. And our kids need to know all of the options available after high school so they're empowered to make the choice that is best for them. In each episode, we explore the latest trends that are shaping the opportunities of today and tomorrow. I'm your host, Betsy Jewell, and this is the High School Hamster Wheel Podcast.